Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. You need to have a nurturing, welcoming sequence. I'm not saying don't make offers. I'm saying don't make an offer before you build a relationship, before you tell them that you can solve it, show them that you can solve their problems. And before you share, you know, let them get to know you first. And one of the good things about e-commerce is that people expect to have an offer in those emails, right? So I'm not saying don't make an offer. I'm saying just soften it a bit, maybe just add a banner in the beginning, So one of the things in e-commerce emails is that when you subscribe to something, you get a 20% off discount or you get something as as a thank you. And that's a great way to build a relationship, to get that second action that you need for uh, subscribers to get invested in in your emails. But I also feel that nurturing that relationship uh, is very, very important. Hi there, Innovator. It's really great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust too that you enjoyed my recent conversations with April Sprintz of Driven Outcomes and Sheila Heen, author of Difficult Conversations. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Summer Awais. She's an email strategist and copywriter who works with SaaS and e-commerce businesses to increase conversions, reduce churn, and fix the money-leaking gaps in their email sequences. Her focus is on writing emails that turn subscribers into buyers, free trials into paid subscriptions, and existing customers into loyal, raving fans. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience, and connect with their ideal clients. To get absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them, check out our Marketing Master Mini Class, where in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free, my gift to you as my listener. In our discussion today, Summer talked to me about the value of email as a relationship building communication channel. She described the essential email sequences that every business should use and also how focusing on one person, one idea, one call to action helps your email stand out and be most effective. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Summer Oase. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today, all the way from Karachi in Pakistan, Samar Awais, who's an email uh, email conversion strategist, possibly also an email conversation strategist that I was about to say, and a copywriter. So welcome to the podcast, Samar. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Hi, Jürgen. Thank you for having me. Now, I think you're the, well, I know you're the first person from Karachi or based in Karachi in Pakistan to come on the podcast, so that's a particular honor. But I wanted to mention also that Joel Kletke, who was our guest on episode 233 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you. So big hello to Joel. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Now, your specialty is writing emails that actually get some results. In other words, they turn subscribers into buyers, they turn free trials into paid subscriptions, and they 
turn existing customers into loyal raving fans. So I'm really looking forward in exploring that a little bit more with you today and learning more about some of the secrets to writing emails that get that sort of result. But before we start talking about all things email and conversion, tell us a little bit about your background. So how did you get to where you are today and what were some of the key moments in that journey? Okay, so there were a few key moments because I've made a few pivots in my career, but it all started with a Google search. Um, I was recently graduated, just married, and have moved to a new country, um, Dubai. Um, UAE, Dubai is an emirate there. Um, and one of the things that is very interesting about UAE is that it was 2008, the recession hadn't hit yet. So the economy was at its peak in the UAE, and um, it was a very competitive job market. And one of the really interesting things back then was that you had to have a driver's license before employers would even consider hiring you. So I decided, let's wait for the job hunt. Let, let's get the driver's license first, right? And so when I registered for my driving li- um, lessons, it turns out there was a six-month wait, And for those six months, I was at home doing nothing and I was bored out of my mind. And so I just ran one morning. I just had it like I was I'd watched all the movies that I could watch. I'd gone out and explored the neighborhood and done all those things that you do when you're in a new place. And so I ran a Google search, like writing jobs online. And I knew that I could write because um, I had just before a couple of months before moving, one of my um, reviews had been published in a Sunday magazine. And so there's another story here. So I was going to go with a friend who was a reporter uh, to a stand up comedy show. And last minute, she had to pull out. And she said, can you please do this review for me? Because I was supposed to cover it for the magazine. And I said, yes, sure. I mean, so I went there, I reviewed it, I wrote it, I sent it off to her. And it was a favor to a friend. But two weeks later, I got a check in the mail. And that's when like, I had my mind blown moment, basically, (laughs) where it's like, oh my God, there's money in this. And so when I was bored out of my mind, I remembered that. And so I Googled writing jobs online and I found this website that was paying $10 an article. And I thought I'd hit jackpot. Uh, But what I'd really hit was a content mill. Um, And it didn't take me long to realize that um, it was really bad money, like for the amount of effort that I was putting in and and the constant learning and uh, 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 improvements that I was doing, like there was no editorial process, nothing. And so slowly but surely, I started uh, finding my own clients, kept learning, talking to people, reaching out, say, how do I break out of this? Um, And I'll be honest, at every step of my journey, people have been incredibly helpful with their knowledge. So they would respond to my emails, they would answer in detail. um, And one of the things that I would do is I would always put their advice to action because I don't believe in taking anything as gospel, like I will try it. And then if it works for me, I will like go back to that person's like, hey, I tried this and it worked and I tried that and that didn't work. And so, you know, it became a relationship with everyone that I was um, asking for help and information. And so they didn't feel like they were um, wasting their time by because everybody likes knowing that, you know, hey, I told this person something and they went and tried it kind of, Mm. you know, and I feel like that's really rare. Um, anyway, so I did that. And then I ultimately grew to a point where I was writing for Marriott and Intercontinental. And uh, I now back then they were interglobal. Um, but there came a point where I couldn't, I hit a ceiling, I hit a payment ceiling. And that's when I, you know, did some joined a course, did some things where I realized that maybe content wasn't for me anymore. Like I'd spent eight years doing it. I learned as much as I could about it. And um, I wanted to try something else. And that's when email came into my life. And um, that was when uh, I just really like, so email came in when I joined Joanna Weeb's uh, uh, 10X freelance copywriter course. And in there I met Val Geisler. Um, And Val was just starting to focus on email as an email strategist herself. And she's this in, incredibly focused person. And she was just like me, right? Everything Joanna was teaching us, she was applying it. 
and her business was exploding. And so she reached out, um, sent out a call saying, I need uh, subcontractors. And so I reached out to her. I said, I've never done email copy, but I'm in the process of, you know, finding a new copywriting specialization. And I, I would you please give me a chance. I don't miss deadlines. I don't make the same mistake twice. And so she did. And she gave me two weeks to write a re-engagement sequence, I think. And that first week, all I did was research. And Jurgen, I was in heaven. Like, I loved every minute of it. And mm. by the time I um, sent in the first draft, I knew that I'd found my copywriting niche. And there's been no looking back since. Yeah. So how is, um, how is writing copy for emails different to writing copy for articles? It's a lot more concise. Um, so with articles, you know how it's, it, it has to be in-depth. It has to be really like, I mean, yes, three to 500 word posts exist, but then how much can you really cover in it? Um, so blog posts are always going to be more time intensive, more work intensive, more knowledge intensive. Um, hmm. But emails are these short bursts of communications, basically, right? One idea, one person. And longer, nobody likes reading long emails, not even when they're from your mom. So yeah. emails are like really concise and um, blog posts tend to be a lot, uh, go a lot deeper into a subject matter. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, so what is it that you do today then specifically? I mean, you talk to email and writing email copies. So what, how do you help people and how do you change people when you work with them? Okay, so when I work with somebody, the first thing that I do is I kind of, I change how they see email. Like I kind of talk to them about it. I educate them about what email it is and what it can do for their business, right? A lot of my clients just think that it's a marketing tool, but it's so much more than that. At the heart of it, it's a communications tool. And so you're not just selling to your customers, you're also having a conversation with them. And people tend to buy uh, on friends' recommendation more than they tend to buy from a um, sales email. Hmm. And so one of the things that I say is that it is a relationship that you are building with your customers. So whatever emails that I create for you will be based on that philosophy. I do not believe in sending out a promotional, you know, seven part email sequence that's just purely promotional. No, there needs to be a reason why you're running a promotion. There needs to be maybe a backstory or or something. There has to be a reason. You can't just run a promotion because otherwise people would just uh, relate your brand to, oh, that brand just runs promotion. I'll just wait for the next one. You know, that's not what you want your customers to think about your business. You want them to, you know, buy your stuff even when there are no promotions running. And so I'm talking from purely an e-commerce point of view because that's what I'm, uh, that's my 2020 goal uh, because I've been, um, I was lucky enough to work with an e-commerce marketing agency over the summer and it just made me realize that e-commerce might be my calling. Uh, because before this, I'd been working with Val and other B2B SaaS companies. And that's great. I love doing that. But I think e-commerce is the, the, the industry that needs the most help. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So um, that's uh, my philosophy. And I feel like even if a prospect doesn't sign me on, whether they're SaaS, whether they're e-commerce, they walk away knowing what's possible if they use email right and one of and that's that's my one big goal like whether they work with me or they don't work with me they should walk away knowing the true potential of email yeah so you've ed educated them in yeah. some form regardless yeah. yeah all right i love that um we were chatting before we started recording about um, you know the, the time as we record this it's just after the Black Friday, Cyber Monday um, specials phase. And I know from mine, I just a few weeks ago, I did a massive unsubscribe of, of all the emails I was getting. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I see that my inbox is just overwhelmed with all these special offers for Cyber Monday and uh, Black Friday. And I guess my question around email in terms of somebody that has an important message that they might want to share me, for example, and I've got all this 
noise, as it were, in my email box. How do you actually get your email to stand out above all that noise and, and get attention from your ideal client? Um, it would be really easy if you'd done the work and built a relationship with them beforehand, right? Mm-hmm. So so when, let's say, when Joanna we or Copy Hackers emails, I always open them because I know that Joanna's emails will be chock full of good knowledge. And she's, as a brand, I've, I believe that she's always out there watching out for me, right? So whatever she is selling, if she's selling anything on a Black Friday, it's going to be good. And this year, I wasn't disappointed. She doesn't do Black Friday, Cyber Monday things, but um, her uh, Black Friday offer this year was incredibly valuable. Um, she's launching a new guest blogging course, but she's also um, launching content school. And guest blogging course is her first one, right? So she's giving people um, access to the course and uh, to this content school and any future um, courses that she releases if people buy now. And that's value because she's mm-hmm. already established herself as this industry leader whose courses are the industry standard, basically. And so it's her offer is a no brainer because anybody who's interested in doing content in learning how to do ebooks, webinar, they know those courses are coming. And so they're going to jump on that. And honestly, they'll be silly if not to, if they're interested, if content is their thing. So it's, you know, you present your offer as a no brainer, basically. And, and that takes planning, that takes time. So I know Joanna's um, thing had been in the works for like more than six months. They'd already they'd already planned all this a lot earlier than just, hey, Black Friday is coming up. We should do this. That wasn't that. When you read her emails, when you go through her um, uh, offer, you realize that it is a well planned out thing. And that's what I feel businesses should be doing for the next Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Um, mm. Don't just pop up out of the middle and say, hey, happy Black Friday, Cyber Monday. And here's, a, you know, we're offering 50% off, but I haven't heard from you in the past six yeah. months, 12 months, and I don't know who you are anymore. So mm. I'm not, you know, I mean, there are people who will buy, of course. I mean, it works. That's why companies will constantly um, capitalize on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. But imagine how much better it will work if you actually took the time to take the rest of the year to build a relationship with your customers and, um, you know, instead of just focusing on acquiring new customers, you maybe can offer something for your existing customers who've already spent money on with you. Mm. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I find frustrating about the Cyber Monday. You know, I get from my suppliers a lot of offers, you know, for new customers, 50% off. Well, yeah. you know, I'm already I'm already paying and have been for several years. How about offering me something? <laughs> But I know. Uh, yeah, so but coming back to the idea of standing out in the email. So what you're saying is, begin by building a relationship and building that relationship right off the bat from the time the person signs up to or whatever it is that yeah. they connected with you in the first place, where they're on your email list. For sure. Yeah. All right. Now, in terms of. Um, some of the sequence, what what are some of the email sequences that you recommend or businesses should be using? I mean, you talked about um, building that relationship. So how do you recommend, for example, to go about that? Because that's probably the first one you should consider. So, yeah, it's it's different for e-commerce and SaaS a little bit, but I'll, I'll go with e-commerce for this one. Um, everything starts with a welcome sequence. I mean, I know, and and I have had so much pushback from e-commerce clients on this, but I'm like, no, you need to have a nurturing, welcoming sequence. I'm not saying don't make offers. I'm saying don't make an offer before you build a relationship, before you tell them that you can solve it, show them that you can solve their problems. And before you share, you know, let them get to know you first. And every email, like one of the good things about e-commerce is that people expect to have an offer in those emails, right? So I'm not Mm. saying don't make an offer. I'm saying just soften it a bit, maybe just add a banner in the beginning. So one of the things in e-commerce emails is that when you subscribe to something, you get a 20% off discount or you get something as as a thank you. And that's 
a great way to uh, 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 build a relationship to get that second action that you need for uh, subscribers to get invested um, in in your emails. But I also feel that nurturing that relationship uh, is very, very important. So tell them what problems you're solving. Tell them what what pain points your product or your service is is going to, you know, they're not going to face anymore. Talk to them about your customer's uh, how, you know, customer success stories are really, really helpful because it shows that somebody else tried your product or service and they got a win. And so yeah. it, it it builds that trust factor. And so these are like, I, I have like this 15 to 18 part welcome sequence where, and, and clients are like, no, just six emails. And I'm like, <laughs> no, sometimes it takes a lot more than six emails to convince somebody. And that's fine because the purpose of the welcome sequence is to get a sale so that they can be moved to the next email sequence, uh, which is the post purchase. Um, and then the second purchase. Um, and so it's, nobody's going to like, there are going to be very few people who are going to wait till the 15th or the 18th email uh, and to buy or not buy at all. And there will be some, but for a lot of them by, by, by the 10th or maybe the eighth email, they would be like, okay, this person's providing so much value. I'm beginning to trust them. I want to try them out. And so it build that tiny, like plant that tiny seed of trust um, and brand loyalty before you go all out asking them for mm. a sale. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so it's the welcome sequence. And then the discount, I'm again, it's e-commerce, right? So discount offer sequences are a thing. And they're for people who don't buy for your welcome sequence. They're not for everybody. And they are, after that, there's the post-purchase sequence and a, a lot of others because with e-commerce, there are, I think, 12 to 13 um, sequences in total if, you, if you're doing everything right and you've got all your sequences in order. Um, and this is before running any promotions, by the way. So there's a mm. win back, there's um, a sunset flow. Um, so there are a lot of those. Yeah. And it's important. I mean, you talked about up to 18 emails before somebody may even purchase, but some people might purchase after eight or so emails because they see that you've given enough value and that they feel as though there's trust there. It's important then to make sure they don't get the other 10 emails if they've already made the purchase decision, right? Which is something that I think a lot of people... <laughs> A lot of people don't do in their email sequence. I uh, end up still getting emails trying to sell me the thing that I've already purchased. Yeah, so you need to stop with the <laughs> if if you're like, like I'm working with an um, I'm consulting on an e-commerce um, with an e-commerce brand right now, and they're just uh, it's a beauty brand, and they're just focusing on making that one offer, like that's their core offer. And so one of the things that I am very emphasized on early on was that as soon as somebody buys this offer, they should not get another email with this offer. It needs they need to move on to another. And and so that's it's like a customer journey for especially for an e-commerce brand. Um, you need to map out the customer journey before you even start writing those emails. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love the idea of, you know correlating the emails with the customer journey and seeing where people are in that. Another one, I'd, I'm keen to get your view on this, another one that I um, think is a bit rude sometimes is the cart abandonment one. <laughs> and um, people come back or somebody sends you an email saying, oh, you forgot to purchase this item. It's still in your, it's still in your cart. And yeah. I kind of think, well, actually, no, I changed my mind before I went to the payment button. Uh, and I just find that crazy because it's kind of doesn't do anything to help me or or strengthen the, any relationship that might have been there up to that point. And it's sort of arrogant in that I was the one that made the mistake. Yeah. So what's yeah. your view so on that? I would always like in my current abandonment emails, I always push my clients to offer them an option. Like sometimes people change their mind and it's okay to acknowledge that there's like, I, there's no reason to be scared of that. Um, and so you need to really just 
face that fact that sometimes people, you know, add things to their cart and then say, no, the total is too much. No, I don't need it. I've changed my mind. And that's fine. You can always say, hey, just click this button. If you, if it was, you know, if it was intentional, if you change your mind and we won't send you any more reminders, it's basic courtesy because, um, sometimes people do forget. We all have like 25, 30 tabs open and you get distracted. Uh, you get a phone call, you have to get up, get coffee. When you come back, you've forgotten all about it. Right. But sometimes people do change their mind and they just close out that tabs. Like, no, no, I'm not buying right now. And so when you say, yeah, I I completely agree with you and I understand your frustration also because I haven't received a single card abandonment email to date, which gives me the option, which acknowledges that maybe I just changed my mind and I don't need this thing that I was trying to buy. Mm. And so that's one of the things that I, it's, clients don't always accept it. Let's be honest, but it's one of the suggestions that I make with my card abandonment emails. Like you need to acknowledge the fact that they're human beings with their own minds who could have just said, no, I'm not going to buy this right now. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with them. In your card abandonment email, you can offer them a discount if you want to entice them, but then also continue to acknowledge the fact that maybe they just don't need this and they they don't want to buy this at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the one of the conversations I had recently with another guest on a podcast, and this was outside of the podcast around card abandonment emails, and his philosophy is, you know, every email should take the person one step further towards their ultimate goal. And so, if they've gone in and looked at a product or a service and done some research to the point where they actually added it to the cart, um, and then changed their mind or got distracted the card abandonment email should read something like, we notice that you didn't complete the purchase and that's perfectly okay. If it was a mistake, here's where to yeah. go to complete the purchase. If um, you've decided not to purchase on this occasion, here's some other information that might help you get to whatever yeah. the goal of that product was this might and so basically you're giving them something for free but it's information know-how guiding them on that path to their ultimate goal so that definitely yeah you're not leaving them behind you're not treating them like somebody that forgot (laughs) yeah and and one of the things that you can also do is when you give them the option that i just changed my mind and i don't plan on buying this is that then you can send them another email asking hey we we saw that you know you changed your mind will you take please take two minutes to tell us why and so this is an opportunity to collect data to uh, to talk to your customers like why are they changing their minds is it the price is it what is it is it something that you're doing that is turning them off and so this is an opportunity to find out to talk to your customers and again it's a relationship building thing because it will tell the customer hey this person really cares this business Mm. really cares and they want to know and you'll be surprised at how many people actually respond um not i mean not all of them do but even if like you send out 50 of those and 10 get back to you that's data that you didn't have those are 10 reasons you know and you you never know uh, gather enough of them and you'll start seeing a pattern mm. and then yeah, you can fix right. and in your next emails you can start you know um making changes that addresses them yeah well that's i mean that's a wonderful example of how you can use email to build a relationship and start a conversation which is not the normal emails that you get and particularly the you know, sales emails are very much one way, you know, the supplier or the sender telling the recipient or showing the recipient, here's what I've got, here's how to buy it, and that's it. It's very much one way, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Now, I know you've um, you talked earlier about pivoting in your business, and I know you've had many challenges and um overcome a lot of challenges to get to where you are today and and also you know you talked about moving to united arab emirates a different country from your home country and now you're back in your home country so a couple of moves 
So talk yeah. to us a little bit about some of the challenges you've had in your business and, and how you've overcome those. And in particular, what mindset you kind of brought to those challenges to kind of make sure you could get over them. Okay. So one of my philosophies in life is that the only thing I have full control over is myself. Hmm. And even following that philosophy, I let uh, uh, myself hold myself back um, for the longest time. I am a Pakistani Muslim hijabi freelance copywriter. And so I was so afraid of showing myself up on camera, of getting on client calls that for the longest time I didn't because I was afraid of the reactions of people. And I mean, ultimately my business suffered. It's like now when I look back on my content days and I think it's probably one of the reasons that I hit that payment ceiling and it was a high ceiling. I was charging $1,000 per blog post when I quit content. Um, and so one of the reasons maybe that I struggled to convince clients to uh, start measuring the ROI of their content and um, you know start figuring out what their content was really making uh, in terms of money and leads, that uh, it was because I wasn't getting on, uh, on, on a call with my clients and talking them through the on camera. I mean, there's only so much that you can explain in Loom videos and emails. Mm. Um, so that was one of the things. But I ultimately got like, over, I got over myself. And it, that also didn't happen until earlier this year when I went to New York for a conference and I met so many wonderful people and I had these tough conversations with them. And I realized that um, a lot of it, it is projection. Like I'm so afraid of something happening that I'm not even giving it a chance. And so I started, it t still took a few months because, you know, you know, when a seed is planted, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And so um, a, a few months ago, I finally started showing up online more as myself. I have, um, before that, I was really like vanilla, afraid to voice opinions and uh, share photos and stuff like that. And so one of the challenges, I still get it, like when I get on a, a uh, on a discovery call or a, or a first sales call, there is that moment when people see me. And I can tell, like some people don't care, but there is that the ones that do care, there's like maybe a, a beat of silence or a raised eyebrow or like the conversation just feels stilted and awkward throughout. And I know this is not going to end. Like they're yeah. not going to sign me on. But then I have, I booked them for those, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. I, as a courtesy, I do give them as much value as I can, and they walk away at least knowing that email is, you know, a better, um, is a communication tool as well as a marketing tool, at least, at the very least. But I ultimately got over it by just ignoring it. Like, mm. I simply ignore it. I don't see that pause. I don't see that raised eyebrow. I don't react in any way because that's not on me. Their reactions are on them. Their biases yeah. are on them. And um, that I feel has really helped. Like it was hard in the beginning. I would obs obsess over it for, for, for days. And it, it makes you feel bad when you, when you do because somebody just judged you on your appearance and um, they didn't give you a chance to really, you know, to find out whether you even, if you could even help their business. But ultimately it's their loss. And I've got like an amazing support system um, in, you know, my peers and my uh, business friends who have always, always just encouraged me. I have so many people to thank for um, helping me get where I am today. Mm. Yeah, the online community is really wonderful in that regard. And even though um, there is a bit of trolling and negativity in some places because of the anonymity of it, uh, you know, we can all get on to Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. And in fact, I deleted just before I come on this podcast, I deleted a comment that somebody put on one of my posts, um, which I thought, um, whilst the content of it was accurate, I was talking about how bad the website loading speed of, of this person I'd had on my podcast was, I thought mm -hmm. it was inappropriate to put that in public comment. And so I deleted it. But that that's an example of, um, and, and there's a lot worse, of course, where people um, post personal 
things on yeah, there. So, so if you know, we're sharing understand. stories, I've got one, <laughs> which infuriated me at the time, but now I can laugh at it. So yeah. there was somebody in one of the Facebook groups I was in, and they sent me a LinkedIn friend request, connection request. And in that message, they'd written, I wanted to send you a Facebook friend request, but I saw somebody who looked like Bin Laden. And so I hope they're not on your LinkedIn. (laughs) And that somebody with a beard was my dad. Yeah. And I was furious that somebody thought it was okay to send that message to me with a connection request. (laughs) Yeah. And um, and I told my dad about it, and he has this amazing stuff. He's laughed and laughed and laughed, and he's like, "Why are you getting angry? Like, it's just somebody you don't even know, just you know." And so I ultimately I didn't respond. I didn't do anything. But I, as long as that connection request stayed in my LinkedIn thing, because I couldn't bring myself to do anything. I was so yeah. mad. Uh, I just kept fuming until finally I just hit ignore. Yeah. And. <laughs> got that person out of my sight but oh yeah. my god that was that was one of the the ones that really really hurt me yeah i um i was with a client recording their podcast this morning and one of the things she said because it was sort of a related topic she said the best piece of advice she'd had was what other people think of you is none of your business yeah. it's the it's their business that's great advice to, yeah. yeah and you get to choose how you respond so, yeah, I love that. Um, talking about email strategy and and copy, so what what are some of the approaches you take to write copy in a way that actually generates a response or generates action on the part of the person reading the email? Because you talk quite a bit about the ROI of copy. So in terms of emails, it's uh, important to know that when you put a lot of effort, whether it's spending money with somebody like you to get the emails written or whether it's investing the time and energy to learn how to do it and and to write them, it's important to know that there's going to be a return on that. What what are some of the strategies you use to write emails that generate action on the part of the reader? There is only one, and that is to think of it as a conversation right? And, or, or even like a blog post. So it starts at the top, which is maybe the, 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 from, it cannot be from a business, right? I don't want to receive emails from, um, let's say some business, business business.com. Mm. I want to receive emails from a person. And then maybe in the bracket, you can say, Hey, or say something like person from business. So I know that this is an actual person emailing me from you know, on behalf of this business. But like, let's say um, I recently um, ordered something from Zazzle. And so now I'm, I keep getting these emails and I love Zazzle. They're an incredible um, service and, uh, you know, they make customized gifts and everything. But it would have been so much better if I received an email from, you know, from maybe Jane at Zazzle. Hmm. And Jane, who would come with me, come to me with personal recommendations of, hey, you ordered this hoodie, you know, and I think these this, these other items would also make for great gift ideas. And so, you know, instead of just get, getting these ideas from a company, I'm getting these ideas from a person, at, even though that person works at that company. And I know that it's a company, but it, it's that mental thing where mm. suddenly you're receiving an email from a person, you're going to, you know, spend maybe 10 seconds more paying attention to that email. It's like if, if you know, you'll think, hey, these are personal recommendations. I should, you know, look at them. Maybe she has a good idea. And I'm into customized gifts a lot. And so I would have paid really good attention. But after that opening that first email, um, I haven't opened other Zazzle emails because uh, I know that when I have a customized gift idea, I'll just go to their website. Their emails are not going to give me much. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so start with the from name, then the subject line, and then the preview text. So it needs to be a continuation of it all. So your subject line need, cannot be the same as your preview text. They could both can't be the same. If the preview text adds context to it, right? And so even before opening the email, your subscriber knows what the email is about. Um, and then always personalize after that just 
start a conversation. And then you're writing to one person, you're sharing one idea, you will have one call to action um, in most emails. Hmm. And of course, there are um, times when there are more than one call to actions, but like that's the general rule of thumb. And so just when you imagine it like a conversation, it's a lot easier to write and it's a lot easier for your subscribers to connect with. Because if, you know, the email subject line says something, promises one thing, and the email copy prompts talks about another, there's a disconnect. And you'll be like, wait, I thought you were going to tell me about that. And so it needs to be in context, everything. And a conversation is that way. Yeah. So, right. hmm. yeah. And it doesn't even have to be a very long email. You can, you know, one idea can be shared in one sentence, in one paragraph, in oh two small paragraphs. So there's that. Hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. I like the idea of, you know, focus as if you're talking to one person, then one-on-one -on -one conversation and one idea and then one call to action and everything being congruent so that um, there's certainty around what the expectation is and what the information is and everything's aligned with what the subject was that they clicked on that got their attention yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Being cute or vague does not work in email. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think people spend a lot of time trying to come up with some cute or um, what they think is clever title or something for email. And then, uh, like you say, it's, uh, I think. I'd rather include a, a, a GIF. Um, I always confuse because I call it GIF, but I've had conversations with people who say, no, it's GIF. It's a hard G. So I always yeah. like go back and forth. But I prefer adding emotion or humor through a GIF rather than a cute subject line. Mm. Um, and then one of those things is that, okay, so here's a copy tip that a lot of businesses I feel miss. If they're using GIFs or if they're using images, they still need to add context um, in their copy, right? Because a lot of people do not have their images turned on. So your email still needs to make sense if they cannot see that image or that GIF. So just one, that's one of the things. Like think if, some, if somebody just saw the text, are they going to understand you, what your email is about? So with e-commerce, that's one of the big mistakes that I see, right? Everything is set as an image. All that information, uh, when, uh, how long, uh, you know, when something is launching or how long the promotion is going to last, it's as it's set as an image and there's nothing text-based. Hmm. So even in an e-commerce email, sure, have that image, but also include the important information as email copy. And so that's something that you can talk to your copy. I mean, copywriters have done their job. They've written a nice email. It's This one falls sometimes falls on the designer more where they just design the email as an image and they can also like easily include it as text. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, what, what's your view on using video inside of email? Scarcely, rarely, but when done well, it can be a good thing because I haven't seen anybody use it well. Um, a lot of times, like the most popular way I've seen videos being used in email is that it comes across as a thumbnail with a play sign. And when people click on it, um, a new tab opens. Mm. But not many people understand how hard or, you know, it is that a video cannot just start playing inside an email, though I wish it was that easy. Yeah. Um, uh, especially in marketing emails. I think Gmail does that. Gmail, you can have play a video within an email in Gmail. But um, in marketing emails, it's hard. There is a way to do it. I'm just not sure how. But videos need to, there needs to be a reason. That's what I'm saying. If a GIF can do it, then let a GIF do it. Don't add a video just because you can. Mm. But sometimes when, especially on onboarding emails, when you need to show something, a video is a nice way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when, and you know, especially if it ties into a uh, customer journey win. So, hey, if you watch this video, it'll show you how to do this. And then, you know, it'll solve your problem. And so in, in those instances, it's great. Similarly, in e-commerce emails, you can include video to show 
how somebody else is using your product. Hmm. So, but then again, don't overdo that. Video is still pretty new. And so just experiment and see what your subscribers or your customers are more receptive to. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point about um, experimenting and then seeing what works and what's not working and making the adaptions. All right, well, this has been fabulous, Samar. I could go on for ages talking email and um, we've just touched a little bit on video there and just brought up a whole lot of other questions, but I'm yeah. aware, of, aware of the time and I think it's a good place to move on to our innovation round, The Buzz, which is designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers and inspire people to go and do something awesome today. So what do you think the number one thing is that anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Keep learning. Because if you stop doing that, then um, I feel when I stop learning, when I stop actively learning about things that interest me, my ideas tend to get stale. Like Mm. to a point where every idea has like, oh, that person's already had it. And... (laughs) you know, and which is fine. It's not a bad thing. But then when you keep learning, you're, you you keep growing and you start making, your mind starts making these connections that it wouldn't otherwise have. And so if you want to keep innovating, just keep learning, just keep seeing what other people are doing, what they're, you know, um, and it doesn't even have to be courses. It could be books. It could be podcasts. It could be articles. It doesn't have to be paid. Learning com- is free. Yeah. Um. So just, you know, That's right. listen, so much... wait over, but you'll get yeah. a lot of ideas. <laughs> yes, there's so much information out there and I, I love learning new things all the time. And also, um, I think you touched on it there, learning outside of what your own particular area of expertise is and seeing what um, how Absolutely. things are done in other areas. So what, what can you take from books or podcasts and incorporate it into email marketing? Mm. All right, now what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? I've talked to people. And so every time I learn something and I have an idea, I go and talk to people because there are people uh, who are, you know, way ahead of me who have probably already had that idea and seen what the pitfalls are or tried it. And, you know, uh, they will tell me that we tried this and this problem came up. So watch out for that. Hmm. it's kind of I and and anytime I have an idea I just go out and I don't believe in um, keeping my ideas to myself because if somebody else can you know can take it and run with it I it was never meant for me (laughs) Um, and so it's you know I I I share my ideas I talk about them and I learn a lot more that way because um, last year I had this one idea where I wanted to help out female entrepreneurs who were just starting out in their businesses and facing challenges like I did when I was starting out, right? And I um, slashed my prices by 70%. And I said, I will help two female entrepreneurs every month for uh, and help them set up their emails, their welcome sequence. Uh, and... I, when I reached out and I told this idea, Prina Malik was one of the ones who told me that, who was the one who said, you need boundaries. You can't just make this offer out in the open and then you'll have 10 people clamoring in. And yeah. then where will your actual client work go? Because that's mm-hmm. the one that's making you money. That's the work that is allowing you to do this amazing thing. And she, so, you know, if I had just run with that actual, uh, that initial idea I had, I would have been inundated with work uh, with, you know, women who needed help, female entrepreneurs who needed help with setting up their um, welcome sequences. And there would have been no time for me to do my client work. So it allowed me, She just talking about that idea allowed me to f- find the pit- pitfalls, right? And somebody pointed out that pitfall and told me what to do uh, and how to uh, mitigate it. Mm. And so yeah. I, every time I have an idea, I run with it to the people I trust. And, okay. um, and I'm like, so, yeah. yeah. And my, my question always like, nip it in the bud if it's bad. Um, so that I can just stop thinking about it and go and get other ideas. Because um, the more I learn, the more ideas I have. 
Mm. All right. Um, now, do you have a favorite resource that you use most often? I do, uh, but resource for what? I have favorite resources for a lot of things. Yeah, anything. <laughs> okay, so all things business, it's uh, 10x freelance copywriter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a course, monthly membership course, uh, and it gives me access to Joanna Weeb and Amy Posner, who are these brilliant business women I aspire to be like. Um, and so they're my human resource in a way. <laughs> Yeah. where I go to them for help and advice. Um, and for emails, my go-to is um, Val Geisler because she's the one who gave me my break into emails and she's also somebody who is so knowledgeable about all things emails. And so everything by her, I, you know, I go to her. Uh, in terms of softwares, um, I was really in love with this um software called uh, Whimsical. It allowed me to create flowcharts and everything. But the more I'm working with e-commerce clients, the more I'm realizing its limitations. So I would not, I'm going to say I'm on the bench with about it. <laughs> but Clavio is an email marketing software that I'm really, really liking at the moment because it gives me really good uh, reporting stats and data for clients. And it's just built for e-commerce businesses. So there's mm. a lot of things that we can try and uh, it's easier to, when I talked about mapping customer journey, it's just easier with Clavio to yeah. customize it, customize those offers in those emails at every touch point. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard uh, good things about Clavio and particularly for e-commerce area. I'm not familiar with it myself. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? I am notoriously bad at this. Okay. <laughs> so when a client comes in, it's like, hey, can you do this? And I'm the kind who will say yes and forget to ask for a deadline extension. And so I have recently hired a online business manager whose first task is to do this. So my best way <laughs> of just um, dealing with this is hiring an OBM. Yeah. Um, who knows that this is my weakness and who will, you know, push me to just either ask for a deadline extension or, you know, whatever needs to be done if I want to take that extra work on. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice. And I, I think people often overlook that and think they have to be good at everything. Uh, but there's ways to actually complement your skills and bring in yeah people that have complementary skills that that will help um, the business. Absolutely. Okay. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Care about your uh, client's business and don't be afraid to speak up if what they're suggesting or what they want to do is going to harm their business. Hmm. Because a lot of times businesses will go after the quick cash or, hey, if we do this, it's going to, you know, um, bring us a lot of money. It might, but if it's going to hurt your credibility, if it's going to, um, you know, lose, make you make your customers lose their, their trust in you, then it's also ultimately going to hurt your brand in the long run. So don't be afraid to speak up if the customer, if your client is doing something that you know is going to be harmful uh, in the long run. Because yes, you're disagreeing with them, but it's also showing them that you care about them. Yeah, that that's great advice. And I think the the idea of the customer is always right. Um, you know, there's you talked about boundaries before, and I think there's got to be some clear boundaries around that um, in terms of what you've just said. That if they're doing something that's ultimately, in your expert opinion, going to um, hinder them getting to their goals or going to send them into the wrong direction or on a wild goose chase, then you really should be highlighting that to them. For sure. All right. Well, thanks, Samar. This has been really great. Now, where can people reach out, find out more about you, and maybe even reach out and say thank you for what you've shared with us today? Um, Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, Summer West, my name, and my website, which is where if you want to talk emails, if you want to talk shop, um, Twitter is the best place to get a hold of mm -hmm. me. Um, for everything else, my website summerwest.com 
Okay. And we'll post links to that on the show notes so people can click straight through and have those conversations. Now, what piece of advice would you kind of big piece of advice would you leave the listener with today, particularly if they want to be a leader in their field and in innovation? Don't be afraid to try things because I mean, for a lot of times we just don't, we have these ideas and we don't try them because what if we fail and it's going to be a public <laughs> failure and then what? Um, I, it's something that I learned the hard weeks. I failed and nobody noticed. And mm. then I was like, yes, I get to try these things and nobody will <laughs> notice. Um, but even if they do notice, sure, but you had the courage to try. And you won't know what, what will work or what won't work or what will give you success if you don't try. So yeah. don't be afraid. Yeah, wonderful advice. And it, it, you've reminded me of something I was going to say this earlier when you were talking about uh, fears. And it was a conversation that I had with, uh, I think it was April Sprintz. So she was on a few episodes back. But she pointed out that the fear of the fear is a lot more painful than the fear itself. <laughs> and so yeah. worry, the worry in advance of whatever it is that you're afraid of is a lot Absolutely. worse. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, um, finally then, Samar, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Bus podcast and why? Two people, Prerna Malik and Justin Blackman. Prerna is this incredible um, launch copywriter. She has these, um, she's one of the very few copy hacker certified copywriters out there. Plus, she managed to grow her business. Um, she's got a very successful business and she did it all out of, by living out of India. And I find that so inspirational. When I was moving back to Pakistan, Prerna was the inspiration that I needed to mm -hmm. know that I could make it. Um, while even though I was moving back to a country where, you know, perceptions were even worse and I would face all these challenges, but knowing that she did it, um, she managed to do it because uh, it, it really, really helped. Yeah, wonderful. And... Yeah, and Justin, because he does these amazing brand voice guides, which will just blow your mind, Jurgen. Yeah. Turned um, on how we sound online and how our writing sounds into a science. And it's it's incredible. You have to talk to him about it. So he'll tell you more. But I, he did one for me, and it was so spot on. Like, he just read two articles or a few emails of mine, and he said, Summer... This is what you sound like. This is what I you feel. And I was like, what is this magic? And it wasn't magic. It was science. It mm. was actual. <laughs> like he has a way of analyzing text, which tells you what your brand voice is. And what's really impressive is that he doesn't just tell you. Then he'll show you how you can turn this into a brand voice that you, re you actually want to sound like. And that had been so helpful to me. It's it's wonderful. You, ha you uh, When you talk to him, he'll tell you more about it. Yeah, yeah. Sounds fascinating. Well, there's a couple of really fascinating guests there. So I look forward to maybe we'll get an introduction from you. I look forward to... For sure, uh, I'll make the introduction. ...inviting them on and having those conversations. Great. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today, Summer. It's been right. wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. I've um, had learned quite a bit today also and um, it's been a privilege to speak with someone in Pakistan so thank you yeah I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch definitely bye I hope you enjoyed that engaging and informative conversation with Summer and took something away from her episode I love her focus on relationships and the human interactions in email and, of course, the one person, one idea and one call to action structure that she uses. I'd love to know what you took away from Summer's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which can be found at innovabiz.co forward slash Summer Oase. That is S-A-M-A-R-O-W-A-I-S. All lowercase or one word, innovabiz.co forward slash summer oase. 
You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Samar there, as well as links to her website, her Twitter page, and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Summer suggested we have a conversation with Pranar Malik of Content Bistro and with Justin Blackman of Pretty Fly Copywriting on future Innova Buzz podcast episodes. So Pranar and Justin, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Summer Oase. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash Marketing Master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery or our help with podcast production, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we'll set up a quick call just to have a chat and find out if we're a good fit for one another. Now, this is our last episode for 2019. We're going to be taking a short break over Christmas, Check in early January, tune in again to our next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Joey Coleman, the author of Never Lose a Customer Again, and Sarah Anderson of Visibility Co. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have, so go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.